This is Here's How, Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast, presented by William Campbell. Thank you for downloading episode 85 of Here's How for the 4th of June 2019. You've probably noticed that you have to get rid of even more pop-ups to see a website these days. That's down to something called GDPR. In this podcast, I'll be talking to the Data Protection Commission about all that. Here's How is Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast. Make your view heard. Just dial 076 603 5060 and tell the world what you're thinking. Your voicemail may be included in the next podcast. You can find tips on recording your contribution and other ways to contact the show at hereshow.ie slash call. Coming up in a few minutes. Since the DPC was created, how many raids have you done? Um, raids versus audits. We conduct audit. We conduct audits more so than sure, actually going in and raiding organisations. And, and, and but how many raids have you done? We haven't raided organisations. We don't go. We don't have the needs. We don't feel. Haven't felt that we've had the needs to go in and actually raid organisations. That's coming up shortly, but first I want to thank my donors on Patreon. I really appreciate what they do. In case you don't know, they donate a dollar or two per podcast or per month. That helps me to devote more time to research and to finding interesting guests. If you think you could do the same, there's details on the website and at the end of the show. This audio is from one of the count centres in the local elections. The people uh, singing are from people before profit who lost most of their council seats, but they've come across Housing Minister Owen Murphy and they're letting him know exactly what they think of some of the proposed solutions for the housing crisis. In case you haven't seen the video, which was tweeted by Irish Times journalist Jack Power, there are a dozen or more people chanting and they're at most two or three metres away from Murphy. In between them, there are a handful of uniformed guardi who make a barrier, but the incident petered out and everyone went on their way. We don't know how lucky we are. Owen Murphy is a senior cabinet minister, one of the most powerful men in the country. We live in a time and place where people can chant their disapproval of him at full volume in the strongest terms and then go about their business. I'm reminded of the case of Niall Dillon, a Dublin man who was arrested and convicted for begging in 2003. He challenged the constitutionality of the law and said that sitting outside a shop with a cop in a quiet and peaceful manner was a right that every citizen should have. The courts agreed. They said that unobtrusively asking passers-by for money was just exercising his constitutionally protected right to free speech. The government was forced to change the law to only outlaw begging that was in some way aggressive or threatening to the public. Just think about that for a moment. A beggar takes on the might of the state. The most humble challenges the most powerful in the land and wins. Take a moment to consider just how unusual that occurrence is. Take any other random time or place in human history. The chances of someone doing that and keeping their head on their shoulders are remote, let alone actually winning. For all its flaws, for all its injustices, its dysfunctionality, its inequality, its maddening bureaucracy, its outrageous corruption, we're lucky to be in Ireland. In many countries, in many of the countries that we consider democracies, the chances of boisterous protesters getting within touching distance of a cabinet minister are remote, and If they did, they'd be carted off to be beaten to a pulp in cells of a police station somewhere. The Economist Intelligence Unit maintains the World Democracy Index, measuring the quality of democracy in every country around the world by objective standards. They have a bunch of them and it generates a score. Of the 167 countries on the list, only five 
score better than Ireland, and they're mostly small with a total population of less than 27 million. So get that, of the 7.7 billion people on the planet, only one third of 1% of them live in a better quality democracy than Ireland. This was not inevitable. Less than 90 years ago, in 1931, Fianna Fáil deputies entered the Dáil with guns in their pockets because they thought they might be arrested and shot. And that was not an irrational fear. That was exactly what was happening in many countries right across Europe at that time. Within the lifetime of people still alive today, someone involved in the democratic opposition to Owen Murphy's party had good reason to believe that they might end up at the sharp end of a firing squad. They didn't, but they might have. Of the peripheral European countries that came to independence and democracy in that period, Greece, Spain, Portugal, democracy failed in every single one except Ireland. And decades of death squads, torture, repression, poverty and stagnation followed. We don't know how lucky we are. So whatever you think of People Before Profit or of Owen Murphy, remember, this is what democracy sounds like. Do you agree? Do you disagree? If you want your point of view heard, dial 076-603-5060 and leave a contribution for the show. The lines are open 24-7 and you can find tips on how to record a good contribution and other ways to contact the podcast at hereshow.ie slash call. On a Skype line now, I have Graham Doyle. He's the Deputy Commissioner at the Data Protection Commission, and he's also the Head of Communications there. Um, Graham, what's the DPC for? Hello, William. Thanks very much for having me on your show. The DPC stands for the Data Protection Commission, and we are Ireland's national independent authority, who, which is responsible for upholding the fundamental rights of individuals um, within the European Union to have their personal data protected. Mm-hmm. So we're a national independent supervisory authority and we are responsible for monitoring the application of what is known as the General Data Protection Regulation or more commonly known as the GDPR. And but this sure has come in on top of the data protection rules that we got, I think, in the late 80s. Am I right? Yeah, we had data protection, I suppose, by way of background for the listeners. Data protection has been around for many, many years now. And we had a, a previous directive back in 1995 that was in place for, for 23 years Mm -hmm. until May, the 25th of May of last year, 2018, which saw the introduction of the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, On top of that, each member state, so the the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR as I refer to it, it is a a harmonized law that applies right across the EU. Mm -hmm. And as well as the GDPR, uh, member states also have passed their own national legislation um, to, to fully bring into play the GDPR itself. And there are also, also some, um, some issues that, that they, the national legislation bring in. For example, um, you know, each, each country has brought in a, a digital age of consent for children. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we in Ireland have introduced fines for our public sector, etc. So we have, a, as well as the GDPR, which came in in May of last year, we also have the Irish Data Protection Act of 2018. And I just want to kind of go through maybe some historic cases so that people get an idea of what you're doing. I remember one uh, sometime back where Ryanair criticised a particular trade union leader who had criticised Ryanair, and they shot back and they said, hey, we have a record of somebody with your name having flown with us, so you're a hypocrite. Turned out... It was a a different person with the same name. But that constituted, as I understand it, a breach of data protection. Tell me why. Yes, I suppose the the purpose of, in terms of data protection, um, what data protection covers, and actually if I can bring it back, to right back to the very very outset, William, um, just to Mm -hmm. explain what data protection actually is. So when we talk about uh, personal data, 
what do we actually mean? So personal data is any information that relates to an identified or identifiable natural person, so living person. So in essence, it's pretty much anything, any information that can identify as um, in any shape or form. So it can be your name, your address, date of birth, PPS number, but can be up to things such as your IP address, for example. Mm-hmm. And in terms of um, in terms of data protection, in terms of personal data, what we're interested in is the processing of that personal data. So the way, kind of when I talk about the processing of personal data, I kind of talk about the, the cradle to grave of what can actually happen um, in terms of processing. So it's from the moment at which an organization collects your data, right through to when they may delete or destroy your data. So that includes if they're recording it, if they're recording the data, if they're storing it in some way, if they're disclosing it or disseminating it with somebody else. So in circumstances such as the one you raised in relation to, say, the Ryanair case, and it just if I, if I take it as, as a general level, if an organization um, is looking to get my data from me, my personal data, whether that be an airline, whether that be an, or, an organization, that I, I'm dealing with in any shape or form. If I'm providing my information, it needs to be very, very clear for what purpose that information, I'm providing that information to them for. Mm-hmm. They need to be very clear. Organizations, in particular since the General Data Protection Regulation came in last year, it has increased the levels of both transparency and accountability on organizations. It's pretty much put us as data subjects or consumers, we're the ones who are now in control. We've been given a lot more control under the GDPR. And as I say, what they call data controllers, but, but we're, in essence, what our organizations, they must be more accountable and they must be more transparent in what they're doing with our data. So we need to know when an organization is getting our data from us, we need to know at the outset things such as, well, what's the identity, identity of the, the, the organization who was actually controlling my data? Mm-hmm. What, what is the purpose for processing it? What is the legal basis for processing my data? So if if I was to translate, Graham, if I was to translate that into, into plain English, if mm-hmm. somebody had booked a Ryanair ticket by going onto their website, type in your name and so forth, would it be the case that a legitimate expectation of the person doing that is that their name and other details are being collected in order to facilitate them flying on a Ryanair flight and Absolutely. nobody could reasonably expect that data to be used to uh, launch a PR campaign against a particular trade union and on that basis the second use is illegitimate and therefore against the against the law uh, absolutely William. that that is that is one that is a good synopsis of the situation you could you know there are there are occasions whereby organizations will rely on say a legitimate interest or they will re- rely on consent so they may actually say to you or I um, you know, you're, you're, whether it's booking a flight and in booking your flight, we also want to know, can we use um, information for marketing or for other purposes? In other words, but, can we spam you with email saying, Go, take a flight to this place or that place? Abso- yes. Absolutely. And you can but, say yes or no to that. Can you then say that, and uh, well, I think we can say because they were disciplined in that case, that Ryanair use that information illegally and then they get disciplined. My question for you, Graham, is, the DPC seems to be fine and I think works relatively well on those type of one-off cases. But there was another incident some years back when a very lucky and extraordinarily lucky woman won the Euro Millions Lottery. She was the first huge winner of like 100 million plus or something in mm. Ireland. And it was very quickly realized that within the days that her, within the day, few days after her name coming into the media, several hundred public servants had gone into computer systems of the social welfare system and tax systems and so forth and looked up her record and people who had no responsibility for any case related to her. Clearly, what they were doing was nosing around about something they'd read in the paper or seen on the telly. What's the protection against that? Well, again, without to be honest with you, William, I wasn't around myself in data protection terms back in the day, although I do... Uh, remember, obviously, when the when the law is uh, sure, won, but at a systemic but, at uh, a systemic yeah, level, what's what's the solution for that? But but again, sometimes this is where data protection things are sometimes pointed towards data protection, where actually data protection in itself may not be may not be the sole issue here. You mm-hmm. know, within an organisation, depending on on the organisation, but within organisations where um, staff members are, as you say, snooping through 
personal records that the a company may hold on their computer system. You know, it's an issue. And, and perhaps not only that, not only for for kind of self interested snooping. It's been fairly clearly established that a number of private detectives have contacts in the public service that are being used by insurance companies that are looking up private records. Absolutely, and yeah. those systemic things don't seem to have a solution that is as effective as, for example, Ryanair publishing information about their, their bookings in a separate context? Well, actually, William, I'd probably say the opposite in terms of the fact that if you, if any of your listeners want to even look back over some of our recent annual reports, in our mm-hmm. annual reports, you can actually see in the last couple of years there have been prosecutions that we have taken um, actually against private investigators who have obtained information in an incorrect in an incorrect manner and um, we actually had is a situation um also uh, last year in 2018 of a member of the department of social protection who was found guilty in the course of a letter kenny mm-hmm. for passing on and um, third party information that had come to us through a complaint so these are but, but that's my, that's my point exactly, Graham. That's my point exactly. The DPC has a relatively good record in dealing with these one-off, fairly obvious breaches. But in dealing with systemic issues, that seems to be a problem. You didn't have hundreds or even one of those people disciplined, and you didn't have uh, the Department of Social Welfare uh, prosecuted. And I, I don't see where the deterrent comes in for that type of thing. Well, in the situation that you're talking about, it's a complaint against an individual that was lodged to, to, it would be lodged to our office. So in circumstances such as the, the case that you talk, that I, I mentioned there about the uh, staff member from the Department of Social Protection, that is a case that is taken against an individual. Now, when you talk about systemic issues, this was one specific case that we were looking at and we were dealing with and we brought it to a resolution. Mm-hmm. As we do on, you know, we've had 6,000 complaints have come in to us since the GDPR came into being in May of last year. And we must handle each um, and every individual complaint that the office receives. So we deal with the issues as the issues arise. There are other, there are other areas in terms of, um, where we look at specific, ex- and there are specific examples where we have, um, last year we conducted a report into the hospital sector mm-hmm. and we looked at the administration of right across a number of hospitals right across the country. So it wasn't just dealing with just one specific, um, incident, one specific complaint. Uh, however, having received a number of complaints in a certain area about a certain issue, and um, we do, we did bring bring together a systemic way of looking at things, and we conducted audits and an investigation, and we conducted, we, we finalised a report into the hospital sector. So we do these things um, as as and when the the needs arise. The other thing to say though, as well, William, is that we ourselves at an office have been growing. Mm-hmm. resource wise which is really really important how many staff do you have we are now up to 137 mm-hmm. but five years ago we had less than 30 mm-hmm. so choices and even with 137 you know choices still have to be made in terms of what exactly where our priorities are going to be what areas we're going to target and focus on we're at 137 now we plan to be at around 165 by the end of this year with, okay, uh, pa- pause, pause with that thought. Pause with that thought mm-hmm. for, for, for a moment, Graham. Because one of the biggest things that you have to do. Oh, by the way, are you still over the, uh, uh above the centre shop? No. Well, we do still have a satellite office down over the cent- over the centre shop in Port Arlington. And there's less than 30 staff down there at the moment and plays it. Po- possibly the most, role. possibly the only centre shop that's been profiled in the New York Times and the Washington Post and so forth. Probably, probably the most famous centre shop in Europe. <laughs> and the reason that they were interested in that was because you guys are responsible for the in across the whole of Europe, as I understand it, regulating Facebook because Facebook's European headquarters is in Dublin. Therefore, it comes under the Irish Data Protection Commission. Facebook has a revenue, an annual revenue of over fifty-five billion dollars. They have two point three billion monthly active users, and they have over thirty thousand employees. It's fair to say, Graham, that probably the canteen in the law firm that Facebook uses has more employees than you guys have. Aren't you just hopelessly outgunned? 
Well, again, I think it depends on the, the way you're looking at, at this situation. When you talk about, you, you mentioned Facebook, but it's actually not only Facebook. Facebook is just one of the very many multinational te- big tech companies. Yeah, well, that other other little ones like for. Google and PayPal and eBay as well, yeah. Well, we've got, we've got Google, we've got Twitter, we've got oh, yeah, Twitter, uh, forgot Twitter. LinkedIn, Apple, Microsoft, uh, quite a significant number of these big tech companies. Uh, we are, as you say, we're what's known as the lead supervisory authority. Mm-hmm. across the EU. So that means if a complaint is lodged in any EU member state, that complaint comes to ourselves for investigation. Mm-hmm. And if there's any breach occurs, it comes to ourselves. But this is a question that I get asked quite regularly, and in particular through the media, and in relation to this whole issue, where people talk about the revenue that Facebook have or the revenue that Google have or any of these big companies, and how do you compete with that? I don't think it's about competing. It's not about um, who has the more resources. It's about us regulating the organizations in a But this is an organization that way. has been connected with massive illegality, absolutely massive illegality in regards to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, whereby they accidentally, they say, handed over vast troves of data that was used to target people in the most unethical and illegal way. And mm-hmm. the, the type of disciplinary measures that you have against them, uh, they'd laugh at. It would, you know, they'd, they'd spend more on tea bags than they would well, on uh, I, those I type of fines. I suppose this is where you and I would differ in our, uh, our assessment of this. But firstly, on the Cambridge Analytica, that predated the introduction of the GDPR. But it was so still illegal the, under the, the GPA. Yeah, no, but just, just to, to explain, it was, it, it was, but it wasn't that the Irish Data Protection Authority was the only authority in Europe that was competent to regulate Mm pre-GDPR. Every data protection authority was. And actually the ICO, the the English or the UK um, Commissioner's Office, they were the ones who conducted an investigation into Cambridge Analytica. Pre the 25th of May 2018, we actually had no power to uh, impose an administrative sanction, an administrative fine Mm -hmm. um, to an organization. Since the 25th of May, we have opened 19, we've opened 54 um, statutory inquiries or investigations in total, 19 of which are into the big tech company. And when you talk about, you're you're mentioning Facebook, eight of them are specifically into Facebook, um, with two into WhatsApp and one into Instagram, which are which are which are Facebook subsidiaries. What's the what's the maximum fine that you can levy? The maximum fine can be for the big tech companies. It will it's up to twenty million or four percent of their global annual turnover. Now, in the case of uh, Facebook, I think it was actually the New York Times um, worked out the 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 maths on it last year, and they worked out that that would work out at about one point six billion if a fine was applied. But again. Which is about the money, about as much money as they make in about 10 days. But again, William, that's talking about it purely from a financial, monetary, punitive element. If you're saying that that's how you you measure success or how well equipped a data protection authority is um, to regulate these firms, I think it's it's a wrong analysis because there are other things. Reputational damage? We now have under, since the GDPR came in, we now have the power to publish as an organization, which we hadn't got pre, um, pre 25th of May 2018. Mm. So when we conduct an investigation against any organization, but you take these big tech companies, we, we conduct an investigation, we can now publish our reports. We can put out into the public domain what's happened. But equally, as part of, and I'm not taking it, talking about Facebook specifically, but any organization that we conduct an inquiry and we find against, and we let's say we impose a, a fine of X amount. With that fine, we will also, where there is need to do so, we'll also be introducing corrective measures, which I think are probably the biggest thing, bigger to bigger in my eyes. Than how just how the would fine. that impact Facebook? Because if you have an organisation who has a model of working, and their model is going in X direction, and we conduct an inquiry an investigation into that organization and we establish that that organization is is not compliant. Well, we will find against the organization potentially, we will introduce a fine potentially, but we will, as importantly, we will then apply a corrective measure where we will tell the organization that in order to, they need to then make themselves compliant. They need to change the model in which the way, and the way in which they're doing business to ensure that they're actually compliant, which again, for for the end user, this is what it is really all about. It's not as a Facebook user or as a as a WhatsApp user or as a 
LinkedIn mm-hmm. um, account holder. It's not, to me, as the end user, it's not necessarily about, well, imposing a fine on an organization. Hold on, but, but, a, but for, for a second, uh, for uh, Graham, because one yeah. thing that they could do in response to that is say, yeah, fine, grand boss, we'll do that, no problem at all, and just hide what they're doing better. And just to put in context what you're saying, the up to 1.4 billion in fines, I suspect that's a multiple of the total fines that you've ever imposed. But to put it in context, there was one day last year when Mark Zuckerberg personally lost about $70 billion in personal wealth because of the fluctuations in the price of the shares. So the potential of, of that fine, I think, is perhaps limited. But I just want to want to you to listen to one clip that I've got prepared here, because this yeah. is uh, Senator Brian Schatz, I think his name is pronounced as. He's a United States senator, and they have enormous power, and they have enormous staff to prepare them, and they generally tend to be quite high-quality people. And I just want you to listen to this exchange between him and Mark Zuckerberg on the floor of the uh, Senate committee. Right. But is there some algorithm that spits out some information to your ad platform? And then let's say I'm emailing about Black Panther uh, within WhatsApp. Do I get a WhatsApp? Do I get a Black Panther uh, banner ad? Senator, we don't. Facebook systems do not see the content of messages being transferred over WhatsApp. Yeah, I know. But that. Um, Did you catch the dodge? No, I must have missed it. (laughs) Mark Zuckerberg completely dodged that question. Oh, sorry, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. The, the issue about WhatsApp. Brian Schatz asked him, does the, con- does the content of the messages in WhatsApp inform the advertising? And he said, truthfully, because it's encrypted, we don't see the content see, of the yeah. messaging. But they don't need to see the content of the messaging in order to allow it to inform advertising. They could quite easily be running something in the background of WhatsApp, which analyzes the content of the message, assigns that sender or the receiver, perhaps, to an ad group for the purpose of receiving ad ads and I've had it and I know that other people have had it I suspect many listeners have had it maybe you've had it an experience where you get or send a message about something completely new something you've never been talking about before on WhatsApp and very very soon afterwards you get Google ads or Facebook ads for that exact thing but my point is that that senator Brian Schatz didn't seem to pick up on the fact that Zuckerberg dodged the question And if Zuckerberg wasn't using that, if Facebook were not using that data to select ads to show to people, surely he would have just said, no, we don't do that, straight out of the gate, rather than dodging the question. Well, again, if I could bring it back to our own role here, William, in terms Mm -hmm. of our regulating of the big tech companies. Yeah, but do you, you, for example, no, Graham, do you, for example, get to pick apart the code in WhatsApp to see what they're doing with the data? If that's where our investigation is, is if that's where our an investigation would be focused, absolutely. So um, you'd get to see can, the source code of WhatsApp. We can. We we have the power as as a regulator to conduct investigations. We can get organisations themselves under uh, Section One Three Five of the Data Protection Act. We can actually get an organisation to go. Um, and to pay for an independent external organization, uh, company to go in and to conduct an analysis on our behalf of the, of the organization. Can, can you can a, you do can you do a no knock raid on Facebook do, to yeah, seize computers do. to to analyze the code? Because of course, if they're willing to lie, which it seems clear that Facebook are, if they're willing to lie, then they then they easily within their capability to send a sanitized version of that code. We do have the power to to audit, audit companies. We do have the power to go in and 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 raid um, raid an organization, not just Facebook. You know where where we feel it is warranted and uh, to to go in and do so. We could. But how many, said, how many, how many, Graham, to, Graham, to, Graham, how many raids have you done in the past year? We haven't done any. We haven't done any. And we haven't concluded any of our inquiries as of yet, William, because... No, 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 I mean are, totally. Of all the companies ever, in since the DPC was created, how many raids have you done? Um, raids versus audits. We conduct, audit, we conduct audits more so than sure, actually going but, in and raiding organisations. And, 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 and but how many raids have you done? 
we haven't raided organisations. We don't go. We don't have the needs. We don't feel. Haven't felt that we've had the needs to go in and actually raid organisations in the in the way in which you're, you're portraying it here. And mm-hmm. um, it's we get we have multifaceted engagement with organisations, William. Yeah. From the level of where we deal with organisations on pre-product consultation. So an organisation will be looking to introduce a product to market. And we will engage with organizations and we can try and ensure that they have a product as compliant as possible when it's coming to market. And then on the other side of the of the coin is our engagement that we have with organizations in terms of the investigations and the inquiries. And as I say, under the GDPR, we now have 19 significant inquiries with uh, big tech companies. We haven't at this point in time felt the need in any of those inquiries to go in and raid or to audit um, as of yet. Okay, okay. However, it's worth noting that Channel Mm -hmm. 4 found found out what was going on with Cambridge Analytica. Neither yourselves nor any other Data Protection Commission uh, or equivalent body in the world did so. It was investigative journalists. But I just want to move on. Once in a while, do you think it's possible that the data protection and GDPR is going too far? For example, I uh, like to look up articles in uh, various American newspapers. And since the GDPR has come in, if you're going to those with a European IP address, you just get a blank page and it says, sorry, we can't show you the newspaper because uh, of legal mm-hmm. constrictions. Um, and I've heard a whole bunch of other things. Uh, f- for example, a hairdresser saying that um, she couldn't tell the woman uh, who was getting her hair done what products she was using because of GDPR and a whole load of other excuses like that. Is it going too far? I don't think the GDPR itself is going too far, William. I think there there are issues out there in terms of people's understanding of, of where it goes. We, we ourselves as an organisation have had to produce a couple of what we call myth-busting blogs um, in recent months. G- give me a couple of the there. best ones. Well, actually, the one you've just done is one of the ones that we've had, which is where a lady appeared on the Joe Duffy show um, and was uh, had contacted her hairdresser because there was a, a family bereavement um, and she wanted to go and she wanted to get her hair done. The hairdresser didn't have um, didn't have an appointment for her, so the lady asked, could she get her hair dye? Mm-hmm. Um, over the phone and she was told that well, she actually had to submit a subject access request to mm-hmm. the hairdressers um, which was completely completely not not correct um, you know there's absolutely no any other no com- pers- any other examples yeah we, we, there's been a very recent one that got a, that got plenty of media attention around um, the um, post office and the removal of public bins from public mm-hmm. places and um, whereby it was felt that there was a data protection reason for um for the for the removal of the of said bins and we were very clear we came out and um, categorically stating that there was there was no GDPR or data protection element or reason to be removing bins that members of the public would be putting would be putting their, their rubbish into. You know, if you follow the likes of that on um William, you know, in in that case you would never have any bins in a public place at all. Yeah, um, which is certainly, which is certainly not the case. So there's quite a there's quite a lot. A it lot it of these, seems to uh, be the new health and safety that when any uh, bureaucrat wants a reason to uh, make your life difficult, they can say, "Oh, GDPR, therefore you can't criticise me." And again, I suppose part of our role here, you know, we've got many many um, angles for our role. Where we've obviously been focusing in on investigation um, here this, today, but you know, there's lots of other things that we have. We've got a we've got a. a a focus to raise public awareness of GDPR and data protection um, as well. So we we have a a team here within the organization who do quite a lot of work with with the public, with organizations, trying to get information out there. We provide guidance, um, to again, to try and dispel some of the myths where there's a requirement to dispel myths, but also to just actually educate um, the public. One of the things I would like to, to just touch on, William, mm-hmm. if we have time, is just in relation to a very recent um, consultation that we began. So it's a consultation on children's rights under data protection. So the GDPR for the first time calls out children as a special category of, of persons who, who deserve special mention and deserve special protection. So what we have done quite uniquely across the EU in um, late 2018 is we've set up this consultation. We worked in in collaboration with the Ombudsman for Children's Office and Mm -hmm. we have opened, we're running two streams to the consultation. The first stream is a public consultation, so where we're looking for adult stakeholders, organisations, parents, etc., 
to um, get involved in the consultation, answer some questions, and we received over 30 responses back um, to that to that element. But equally as important, um, in January of this year, we launched the children's element, whereby we have we have done lesson plans up for every school in the country and all youth reach centres. So children from the age of eight up to sixteen, we've got information out there to them, and we're, we sought their feedback and get ideas around really, really, really important issues, and um, particularly in the, in the context of, of digital and online safety. So I mentioned earlier. Um, that the Irish Data Protection Act, it, it sets the age of consent, the digital age of consent here in Ireland at 16. So there are, there are certain questions that have been going around for many, many years now around the world, um, such as how do you actually verify that a child is 16 when he or she says that they're 16? Mm-hmm. Or in terms of parental consent, how, do, how does a company, um, a social media company, know that if I give my... 14 year old son my consent that it is actually me giving my con- my consent for on his behalf and that it's not just him doing it yeah yeah um, I, I i i'm sure people in uh, various contexts are familiar with clicking on a thing i am over 18 but i don't absolutely. want to no, i i don't want to go absolutely. through that and what i will do is uh, i will link to that in the show notes of this because i want to try and i understand what you're saying and i want to try and keep focused on this because of one last topic i want to deal with you in may 2013 alan shatter said on rt prime time told about a particular alleged offense that had been committed by Mick Wallace, then TD, and it would appear that he got that information verbally from the Guard Commissioner Callanan, and he used that essentially as a political tool in an attempt to damage the reputation of Mick Wallace. Mick Wallace took a case against that, and 11 months after Mick Wallace had brought the case, the then data protectioner who was Billy Hawkes at the time, previous to Helen Dixon, who is now the newly reappointed uh, commissioner, he made a statement 11 months after the complaint had been made, saying that he would allow another month to see if Alan Chatter and Mick Wallace could settle the dispute amicably. Are you sure that's proper? That seems terribly improper to me because, uh, first of all, we all know that uh, Mick Wallace and um, also his colleague Claire Daly had played a very central role in highlighting serious corruption within the Gardaí. It would seem that a Garda commissioner who has still very serious question marks over him and uh, his, his the, the way he, he conducted his office supplied this information to smear Mick Wallace. And anyone who thought that uh, Mick Wallace and Alan Shatter would come to an amicable settlement of that seems to have very little understanding of the political reality of that. But even if that wasn't the case, even if there wasn't that personality clash, when you've got an individual against the might of the state where somebody is placing a lot of pressure on them to come to an amicable settlement, that essentially means that whoever is the more powerful entity gets their way. Isn't it the, isn't it the, the, the requirement, the purpose of the institutions of state, including the Data Protection Act, are to prevent the powerful from running roughshod over the rights of the individual? Isn't it just on a point of principle wrong that people should be put under pressure by delaying and delaying cases to settle them amicably? They should be settled by the law, shouldn't they? Um, there's a couple of points that you're making that way, but, just the basic principle and the basic idea of amicable resolution. Mm-hmm. When we're de- when we're dealing as an office with complaints that we get to be uh, complaints that come in here, when we're trying to deal with them amicably, mm-hmm. firstly, there is no. It's not that we're looking to put pressure on any individual where we're saying it must be done in this way or it must be done in that way. But that's the reality we, of the well, outcome. No, well, what we quite often see, William, is that people come to us with complaints, and actually, we we spend a, a a huge focus of, of the interview, again, and say, talk about big tech. Mm-hmm. But the big tech companies actually form less than 10% of the complaints that are actually made and received to this office. Mm-hmm. And one third of the complaints that we get, around one third of the complaints uh, that we received up until the end of last year, since GDPR came in, yeah. were, were into things known as subject access rights. Yes, so that's saying I want to get information about myself. Maybe I'm an employee I, and I want to see my employee records. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that includes public sector, private sector, etc. Quite often what we do and how we how amicable resolution comes in is that the individual is not necessarily looking for a long drawn out process whereby it's going to take a bit of time, may even end up in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. What the person is coming to us for is an actual resolution to their problem. Yeah. They want us to try and help and they want us to get to the bottom of whatever it is they're looking for. And somewhere around one third of the, or sorry, just over one third of the complaints that we closed last year, a significant number of them were done through amicable resolution. Okay, but so, that's, a, that's a very, very different context to where you have someone like Mick Wallace, who was central to the highlighting of many, many very, very serious cases of Garda corruption. We know that uh, his colleague, uh, Claire Daly was arrested and handcuffed in highly mm-hmm. irregular circumstances. So you're dealing with people who are right at the cutting edge of state corruption. And when you say then, oh, well, you know, we've sat on this for nearly a year and not issued any uh, finding and we're going to sit on it for another while. Just as delayed is just as denied, isn't it? Well, in circumstances, you know, without getting, I don't want to get into the specifics necessarily of these individual uh, issues that were going on, but to take to take to an extent the one that you're talking about, it would not have been the case that this office would have been sitting on something for 11 months and doing nothing. Um, they would have been trying to, and we're trying to resolve the matter in some way. Uh, as you said at the outset, if a decision was made by the commissioner of the day to give it one more month to see if it could if it could be resolved, there was obviously a a feeling that it could be at the time. But in giving it the extra money, it was, actually, it, was, it was setting a target. It was setting a target to say we're going to close off this angle to to the complaint within a month. It was a it was it, it was adding finality to to that element of the process. I, I get what you're saying, particularly in an employment context, and particularly in an employment context, you don't want to trigger an awful lot of ill will. Somebody has to go back in and, and you know work in that place, hopefully, and they may want you know just a clarification from you guys. But in a high profile case like that, or you know a case where somebody is up against the might of the state. Justice delayed is justice denied, and that does really seem to be to use the power of the state to try and essentially bully people into accepting less than what is their rights. Well, that's certainly not the intention of this office. The intention of this office is to uphold the individual's rights to have their personal data protected um, that has been the, the mandate of this office and that has been the, the ethos behind this office for many, many years now, William. So, you know, as a, without repeating myself, if, if a decision is made by the office to try and amicably resolve any matter whatsoever, it is being done in the best interests and for the right reasons. And um, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes you can't resolve something amicably and Ultimately, it goes in a different direction, whether that be something becomes an investigation and um, things sometimes end up in court. But I can mm-hmm. certainly say that the, the ethos of this office and the, the way this office works um, and the way the staff work here is not to delay things for improper reasons. It's to actually try and get to a resolution. Graham Doyle, a Deputy Commissioner and Head of Communications with the Data Protection Commission. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you, William. Make your view heard. Dial 076-603-5060 and leave a contribution for the show. You can find tips on how to record a good contribution and other ways to contact the podcast at hereshow.ie slash call. If you'd like to hear more podcasts from me, I'd certainly love to do them and I could devote more time to them if I got them sponsored. I have a page on Patreon that allows ordinary listeners to donate a dollar or two per podcast or per month, whatever you want. So if you think it's valuable, please do that and share the podcast to your friends so that they can do the same. Go to the website for sources and references from the show. And while you're there, please like the show on Facebook, follow at Here's How Podcast on Twitter, and follow the Data Protection Commission at DPC Ireland. And get in touch with me if you can suggest a guest or topic for a future show. Also, you can find out how to subscribe to the podcast for free on your computer, on your phone, or by email. All that, including my Patreon link, are at www.hereshow.ie. The next show will be uploaded next Tuesday, that's the 11th of June. I'll have an interview with the Head of Communications with the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. 
The Here's How podcast is produced and presented by me, William Campbell. Thank you for listening.